Well, good morning. It is lovely to see you. It is always wonderful to be joined by so many learners across, across London and other parts of the UK as well. And one of the things I always have in my head while I'm, I'm writing these talks is trying to uh, include objects from the British Museum, um, many of which are on public display so that if you're able to get to the museum, you can actually see them in the galleries. But also having a little think about what stories we have in the museum that aren't quite as obvious, that aren't told as often, um, that might resonate with interest that I can feel coming from you in terms of feedback from the different talks. Uh, so yes, feedback is really useful because any comments people make, uh, the, even the questions you ask help to give me an insight into the areas of the museum collection that you're interested in and, and the sorts of themes and aspects of its history that you would like to hear about. So this week we're going to be coming a bit closer to home because we're going to be talking specifically about objects in the British Museum collection that come from London. So without further ado, let us set up the talk. Let me pick up my trusty pointer and let us begin by saying that when I talk about London today, we're talking about the 33 boroughs, but also thinking about London within its geological context. Because certainly when we get into the prehistoric period, we're not looking at one single settlement in the way that we think about London in the historical context. And we know that if we're thinking about prehistoric London, then we're thinking about what geologists would call the Thames Basin, the London Basin, that area of lower land that spreads out either side of the River Thames, which runs through the centre of the modern 33 boroughs, that then extends the basin itself northward towards the Chiltern Hills, and then southward towards the North Downs. And the London Basin lays in that area of lower land between those two ridges of hills that run west-east. And human activity is evident from across the geological London Basin with the concentrated settlement which becomes London next to the River Thames, which is the largest body of water flowing from west to east out to the sea. And all the objects discussed today come from the central area of the basin covered by the modern 33 boroughs of London. We're going to start our journey in prehistory and we have to point out that London's Paleolithic landscape, nothing like what we're experiencing today. Instead, Paleolithic London, very similar to today's Central African Plains. And Paleolithic Britons shared the landscape of Southern Britain with animals such as hippos, rhinos, and mammoths. And excavation has shown that these animals lived across the river basin. And this artist's impression, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, commissioned by the Natural History Museum, shows us a scene from 120,000 years ago. And this is what you would have seen if you were standing in modern day Trafalgar Square, 120,000 years ago. So a very different landscape in the Thames Basin at this point, very different in terms of animals and plants in the basin, and no concentrated human settlement. So what was actually happening during prehistory at this time? Well, here's our first object from London that we're going to look at today, and this is a Paleolithic hand axe and it dates to 350,000 years BC. And it's made from flint. It's got some slight orange brown staining on it from the gravel that it lay in when it was buried beneath the ground before discovery. Now hand axes have got razor sharp edges running along both sides to the tip. And they were used primarily for skinning and butchering animals, but they could also be used for cutting vegetation and wood. And you make a hand axe by chipping 
small flakes of flint off a lump of flint in a process known as flint napping. And you can see a small diagram here to the right, which shows the flint core or nodule being struck with possibly another stone, also can be struck with hard wood. And we know that bones such as hard antlers were also used as striking tools. And then smaller pieces of flint then flake off, which then creates the hand axe, which continues to be worked along the edges to create the sharp, razor sharp edges for working. Now, hand axes have been made for over a million years by humankind. And the first ones in Africa around 1.6 million years ago. And then all over the world as these early humans journeyed out from Africa. This particular example at the British Museum was discovered by a London apothecary and archaeologist, John Coney's who ministered to the sick during the 1665 London plague, but then in a, a huge ironic twist of fate, lost his house to the great fire of London the next year. The hand axe was discovered in 1673, along with animal remains, specifically from a prehistoric elephant, during works to divert the River Fleet into a conduit at, Harry, at Farringdon. Now, Hans Sloan later acquired the hand axe and the elephant remains, and they became part of the British Museum collection when all of his objects passed into the Nissen British Museum collection in 1753. The elephant remains have not survived. They were probably discarded due to poor conditions in the early 1800s when the natural history collections were reorganised, or could have been discarded when this material was moved to South Kensington to what was to become the Natural History Museum in 1884. If we now move forward in terms of London's history, we find our next object dating to around 9000 BC from what archaeologists call the Mesolithic period. Now, during the Mesolithic period, Rising global temperatures meant that the previous Ice Age tundra was being replaced by forest. And Mesolithic people in Britain lived as largely nomadic hunter-gatherers, and they leave us flint tools and butchered animal bones. And examples of these have been found at Three Ways Wharf at Uxbridge, and also along the Old Kent Road. And in addition, fish and waterfowl from the rivers and wetlands of the London Basin also formed part of the diet. And interestingly, if we come more toward the centre of London, in 2010, archaeologists discovered six timbers on the Thames southern shore at modern Vauxhall. And ra radiocarbon dating has showed that these were Mesolithic, making it the oldest known structure on the Thames foreshore. Now the function of this structure remains unknown. Perhaps it was a jetty for fishing boats or a platform for ritual activity. What we do know from studying the timbers is that the timbers would have been shaped with a woodworking tool such as an adze. And we have an example of this on the screen from the British Museum. Now this particular adze was found in Hammersmith and it's made from the long bone, perhaps the thigh, of a wild ox. We've got an example here of a reconstruction drawing of what the wild ox in prehistoric London would have looked like. And the bone has been chopped at an angle to form a cutting edge. And originally this central hole would have been where a wooden axe would have been fitted through this three centimetre diameter hole. It was probably wooden and would have been secured with sinew, which as it dried would have tightened and held the handle in place. And we know that Mesolithic forests of the time offered an abundant source of wood, which was a very versatile raw material 
used to make objects such as the boats that would have been used on the rivers and wetlands of the London Basin. Wood does not survive well in cold, wet British soil. Hence, we do not have the handle, but we have the top cutting structure from an adze. And interestingly, on the far left hand side, there's a panel of carved chevrons on the upper surface, perhaps indicating the symbolic nature of the tool. Because as well as having a functional nature, this was an object which had the power to transform a tree trunk into usable timber. And the fact that it's made from the bone of one of these hefty wild ox also made it an object to carry around with pride. Now the decoration itself, these carved chevrons, are similar to ads from modern Denmark. So it may be that the person who made this was from that area, remembering that Britain at this time was connected by a land bridge to the continent. And Britain did not become a set of separate islands until around 6000 BC, over a thousand years after this object was made, used and then deposited in Hammersmith. Let's keep moving forward. And now we've got to 4000 BC and we've got to a period of history known as the Neolithic. And during the Neolithic period, we see the arrival of farming in Britain and the development of a settled agricultural society. Agri um, beg your pardon. Archaeological remains also reflect growing social stratification, which seems to suggest an elite dominated society, who around 2000 BC buried their elite in earth mounds known as barrows. And we know that in southeast London, barrow cemeteries, so groups of barrows specifically created as a burial site, were established on high points which offered views over the Thames landscape. Now, most of them have been destroyed by modern building, but a small number survived, including the example we see here on screen, which is nowadays known as Shrewsbury Barrow, and it's in Shooter's Hill. What we also have on screen is a hoard of gold objects from Bexley, known as the Bexley Hoard. And these date to about 1000 BC, and they were found 90 centimetres below the present ground level, beneath what appear to be the floors of prehistoric structures that stood in Bexley at the time. And the analysis of the gold in the objects indicates a gold content of 82%, so very pure gold. And the hoard itself and its burial in a settlement site could suggest either the elite wealth of an individual or community wealth of a group of people living at that time in Bexley. Now, these objects were found buried beneath the ground. And later on, we're going to pick up this idea of ritual deposits uh, which we hinted at when we were looking at the Mesolithic structure at Vauxhall, which may have been for depositing objects in water. And here again, we have an object deposited in the ground, which hints either at a safekeeping, so keeping your precious objects safe by burying them below a settlement, so they were constantly guarded, or perhaps some element of ritual deposit, the action being linked to belief in the deities and the religious worldview at the time. And we'll come back to that in a moment. What we're going to do now is carry on through prehistoric London, and we're going to arrive in the Bronze Age. And for the latter part of the Bronze Age, through into the Iron Age, there appears to have been increasing militarization of British society. 
And there was the construction of large earthworks known as hill forts built on high ground. A very well-known example of this is Maiden's Castle in Dorset. Now in London, a number of hill forts are also known, including Amesbury Banks and Loughton Camp, which are in Epping Forest. There's also a hill fort known as Caesar's Camp near Bromley, and another hill fort south of Wimbledon Common, also known as Caesar's Camp, though they have no connection with a Roman date, coming as they do from the period of history known as the Bronze and the Iron Age before the arrival of the Romans in Britain. And what we're looking at here on screen is an Iron Age object, dates to about 350 BC, and it is a shield dredged from the bed of the River Thames in 1857 during construction of the predecessor of Chelsea Bridge in Battersea. Now it's not a complete shield. What we're looking at here is the facing, a metal cover which would have been attached to a leather or a wooden shield. Now the facing itself is made from four sheets and we can just see one sheet and we have a join area here, sheet number two, there's our next join. So we have four sheets set together in a curved oblong shape with three roundels which would have covered the middle join for the sheeting running down the centre. And it's held together with bronze rivets. And also, if you look out to the edge, particularly at the top here, or in the photograph, the light just catches the edge of the object, you can see it's also held together by a bronze binding, which runs all the way around the edge. Now, analysis of the object shows that it's an alloy. It's 85% copper, 10% tin, and 5% lead. And there's a domed boss at the center of the shield, which is probably positioned over where there would have been a handle at the back of the shield. So it's additional protection for where the user's hand was holding the shield against their body. And also the fact that it sits proud of the shield means that any glancing sword blow would have been bounced, would have been directed away from the surface of the shield. Now the shield was almost certainly made in Britain because of the specifically British form of this central boss. And the bronze sheet is too thin to have offered effective protection in combat. And in addition, regardless of whether it was originally attached to a wooden backing, the facing shows no sign of battle damage. There's no repair on it. It's therefore probable that the shield was thrown into the River Thames as a votive offering to the gods and made either as a parade piece, a status symbol, or specifically as a votive offering. And before we leave this object, I just wanted to draw your attention to the two small close-up photos on the right-hand side of the screen. And these are taken from the central roundels and when you first look at the shield, it looks like a beautiful geometric design, um, often referred to as, as Celtic design or Laten design after an area of France where a lot of similar objects have been found. Um, here, for example, this bottom one, which I've rotated, can be seen below and above the central roundel. When you look at them more carefully, what you start to see is that this motif is actually quite playful. You've got little curls of vegetation, little leaves and stems. And here in the top one, we have a bird with its beak. And then the one at the bottom, well, I think this, this must be cattle. This must be a cow or an oxen. Look at those beautiful horns and going down past the eyes to the stylized nose. So the closer you look at these objects, the more these little geometric patterns 
uh, start to develop into little vegetative motifs, usually leaves and stems, and also the animals that would have been seen around the people living in Iron Age London. Whether it's their domesticated cattle or the wild birds living in the wetlands. We've got here another example of an Iron Age shield mount. This was found in Wandsworth, again found in the Thames, probably deposited as a votive offering. This is actually only the centre part. This is the round central boss with an attached flat flange running around it. And it was probably originally mounted and you can see holes in the centre part of the mount. And then also if you look carefully all the way around the edge, there's a series of little holes where small rivets or nails would have held this onto a wooden or a leather backing, probably similar in shape to the oblong Battersea shield. This one again dates from about 350 BC and it's decorated with two birds with outstretched wings and long tails. It has a central boss, as with the Battersea shield, and you'll notice here that the central button area on the boss is empty, but originally that would have contained an ornamental enamel stud, just as we saw on the Battersea shield. And what I also like about this one is that if you look carefully inside the wings and the beak area, area of the birds, there is additional engraved design which has been scratch carved onto the soft surface of this mount. And here we can see in its wing, we've got a whole bird inside the wing of the larger bird. We've similarly got another bird inside the small bit of the wing. And then if you look at the beak, you can see where they've drawn in additional triangles to sort of give a, a 3D effect to raise up the beak away from the face. And then if we take our eye diagonally across to the other side, there again, we have the birds carved into the wings. And this one here I rather like, because if you look at it carefully, you can see it's actually been incised so that the two wings are outstretched, as if you're looking at the bird face on. So wings within wings. We're going to leave prehistoric London now and we're going to move through the Iron Age to the coming of the Romans and we're going to start thinking about Roman London and what we're going to look at here is we're going to look at a few objects which give us a little insight into everyday life in Roman London. Now around AD 50 the Romans built a settlement where London now stands. And at this point, England had become part of the Roman Empire, which previously had stretched all the way into Roman Gaul, modern day France, stopped short at the English Channel. And then with the invasion in AD 43, the Romans pushed out from South East England, up towards Wales, up towards the lowlands of Scotland, to create the province of Britannia. Now it's known that this settlement, known as Londinium, lay at a key crossing point over the River Thames. And from AD 50 to around 410, this was the largest city in the Roman province of Britannia and also acted as an international port within the empire. At its height, around AD 120, Londinium was home to around 45,000 people. And the Emperor Hadrian himself visited the city in 122. And then shortly afterwards, the Romans built a defensive wall around the landward side of the city, the London Wall, parts of which still survive today, most notably outside the entrance to the Museum of London in East London. And what we're looking at here is a piece of Roman cookware. It's a mortarian excavated in St. Martin le Grand in the city of London, right in the centre of what was Roman Londinium. It was made in Britain. It was made in 
modern St Albans in Hertfordshire and on the rim we can see where it is inscribed it's been printed before being fired with a small inscription stamp which tells us that it was made by the potter Sulus who was working in St Albans Roman Verulanium. Now the Romans introduced a lot of new cooking ingredients to Britain and we see an example of some of them here listed on the left and Roman tastes tended to favour sauces, relishes, herbs and spices and these would need to be ground and a strong mixing bowl with a grit roughened interior and a lip for pouring out the ground ingredients or any liquids was essential kitchen utensil. And Martoria had first appeared in Britain before the Roman conquest, implying that there were people in late Iron Age Britain who were starting to enjoy this form of Roman cuisine. And in this photograph, you can just see where before it was fired, pieces of grit are pressed into the surface of the clay inside the bowl of the mortarium. And this is what gave it its gritty rough surface, uh, and rather like a, um, a very rough version of a pestle and mortar that we use nowadays. So that as you ground it with a mortar, the grit would crush and break up the different herbs and spices to blend them into your powder for adding to your dish or putting a liquid in to then make a flavoured liquid sauce that could be added to cooking or poured onto the finished dish. Continuing with the idea of Roman dining ware, we have here a piece of Samian ware. Now this is very high quality Roman tableware. And most of the Samian ware found in Britain was made in Roman Gaul, modern France. We know that British Samian ware was produced at places such as Colchester. However, the clay from Britain was inferior and therefore native production didn't last very long. You got better quality from the clays that lay in the geology beds in Gaul. So it was made in Gaul and then shipped across the channel to be sold in Roman Britain. Now, Samian is usually red. It can either be plain or it can be decorated with patterns and pictures. And plain Samian is wheel thrown, dipped with a red slip and then kiln fired. Decorated Samian ware, such as the example we see here, is actually made in a mould. The clay is pressed into the mould, which is carved internally with the designs and patterns. So as you press the clay in, the wet clay goes into the patterns inside the mould. When it dries, it shrinks, which means it can then be lifted out of the mould and fired. And we usually know the individual potters who have made pieces of Samian ware because name stamps are either pressed into the clay before it is fired or decorated ware can have two maker's marks because there'll often be a maker's mark incised into the mould, which is the person who made the mould is advertising that this is one of their moulds. And that then comes out as part of the pattern when the clay is pressed into the mould. And we can use these makers' marks to help us date the Samian ware because certain makers worked at certain times. Now, this particular bowl was found in Bishopsgate in the city of London. It was made in southern Gaul, near the border with modern Spain, and it has a marker's make on it. It was found broken. But when reconstructed, it was nearly complete and it has two freezes. It's got an upper freeze. And if you follow the pointer from the left, it's decorated with a little dog running. We then have a panel of arrow shaped objects. And that's repeated as an alternate panel all the way around. We then come to a panel with a picture of a goat lining down, looking at a plant, which I assume it's about to eat. And 
Then we go back to the arrowheads, and this was repeated four times all the way around the bowl. And then in the lower freeze, which is quite badly damaged, but you can just pick out in the lower freeze that we've got a decoration of vegetation and also birds. And then at the top, vertical lines decorating the rim. And it suggests that people living in Roman London had the means to not only buy such fine tableware, but one would presume the opportunities, the dining occasions, to let others see it. Our next object is a silver guild Anglo-Saxon fitting. And it probably was originally fitted to a knife scarab. It dates to the late 700s and at the end, and here you can see at the bottom I've put a blown up detail of the end, we have an animal head with sharp ears which join behind its head, blue glass eyes and a tongue which curls out from the mouth between the fangs back so that it touches the throat of the animal. The strip's decorated on one side only, and it would have been riveted onto either wood or leather by groups of rivets. And here you can see there's one complete set of three rivets. And then if you follow with your eye along, you can see where there would have been the next set of three rivets. And then following on, at this point, the rivets have been lost, but we can see the first hole and a half from the next set of three rivets. Now the front of the surviving strip bears an inscription in Old English using the runic script, but this inscription has not so far been satisfactorily interpreted, though it could be amuletic, it could be a, a good luck charm that's been carved onto the scarab decoration. The fitting itself was dredged from the Thames near Westminster Bridge, and an early Anglo-Saxon settlement was in this area. So the early Anglo-Saxon settlement was not on the site of the Roman city. Instead, by around 670, Anglo-Saxon Londonwick was developing in the modern area of Covent Garden. Now the old English term wick means trading town, so London Wick means London trading town. And this settlement stretched along the north side of the modern Strand, Strand meaning beach. At that time, there was no embankment. So the Strand would have stood on the edge of the wide flowing River Thames. And the settlement stretched from the modern day National Gallery in the west to Aldwych in the east. Originally, this fitting would have been V-shaped. There would have been an additional strip running along the bottom, and you can just see where that additional strip snapped off. This may have been the reason it was thrown away, because it was broken. Um, it may have gone into the River Thames attached to the original scarab, and as the original scarab and was then damaged by the water. Uh, it seems unlikely that we will ever know the exact reasons for its deposition in the River Thames, but it is a beautiful survivor from the Anglo-Saxon period and the early Anglo-Saxon city of London Wick. What we have next are two coins, both minted in Anglo-Saxon London Wick. We have to say at this point though, that mint in this context covers all the individual moneyers operating in London. And there's no indication in Anglo-Saxon London that there was a single mint building where all the coins were created. So they were made by individual moneyers working in their individual workshops across London. And we know from the 1830s, Viking invasions were frequent and a Viking army probably camped in the Roman walls of London during the winter of 871. King Alfred regained control of London in 886 and renewed the fortifications. And once more, 
the Roman city became the main settlement site, now known as Londonburg. The former London Wick was largely abandoned and over time became known as Eldwick, i.e. Old Settlement. And this has survived in the modern day naming Old Witch. Although the political centre of Anglo-Saxon was Winchester at this time, King Athelstan held regular royal councils in London and later King Ethelred favoured London as his capital and issued his London Laws in 978. And we have here at the top a coin of King Athelred, King of England, a coin minted in London between 997 and 1003. And on the back, you can just see here at the top, the initials, the letters L, B, N, D, standing for Londonburg, London. So an indication of where the coin was minted and an indication by his portrait and his name on the front of the reign of the king during which it was minted. And down below, we have another coin minted in London, but this coin is King Canute, who was king of England, Denmark and Norway between 1016 and 1035. Now in 1016, Canute as a Danish prince had landed in England and took the throne from Edmund, the son, of Ethelred. Knut then inherited the throne of Denmark, seized the throne of Norway and took control of parts of Sweden, meaning that at the point when Knut was at the high point of his career as king of England, Denmark, Norway and parts of Sweden, London itself became part of a short-lived Anglo-Scandinavian North Sea Empire. So as in Roman times, London again sits as part of an overseas empire at this point. We are now going to move from early medieval London to later medieval London and we're going to be looking at some objects which come from Elizabethan and Jacobean times. Before we do that, we're going to take a 10 minute break and during that 10 minute break, I'm going to leave our two coins on the screen for you to have a closer look at. Uh, Ethelred at the top and Canute at the bottom and do have a look in particular at the back and see where you can pick out individual letters that indicate they were um, created in London and then on the front lettering indicating in whose reign they were minted. See you in 10 minutes. Have a nice break. I had a little look in the questions and I saw there were a couple of questions about the coins, which I'll do while they're here on screen. Uh, there was a question about what were the coins made from? They're both silver, uh, which was one of the main currency metals during this period. And indeed, when we think about this period and Danish raids, which then necessitated frequent payments of Danegeld uh, to pacify the raiders, this was often paid in silver pennies, such as this. It was the main trading and currency metal of the time. The fact that they look very different is down to a couple of factors. One, all coins will develop a patina on the surface over time um, due to being handled. And in these coins cases, um, due to burial in different materials, so the type of soil that they're buried in will have an effect on the surface of the coin. Uh, the second effect is a very simple one, modern photography. Um, and just the way that the light is set or the adjustment of the colours when that photograph is then loaded onto the collections online database can radically change the colour of the object between what it looks like in reality and what it looks like when it's been photographed. Uh, but they are both silver pennies. Uh, someone then asked about Ethelred's hairdo. Yes, he does have a very natty hairdo. 
um, it's a stylized portrait, so not a realistic portrait in the way that we would understand it. Um, a profile from the side in the manner of the Roman portraits that they would have been aware of from Roman coins circulating in early Anglo-Saxon England. Uh, so we have a profile and Ethelred himself has been shown dressed as a member of the elite of the nobility. So he has his cloak caught with a large brooch at the neck and then this very fancy stylized hairdo. Canute in comparison, again a profile shot, again he's robed as per the elite, he's got a decorated border to his tunic, what appears here to be a large round brooch. He's shown with his scepter, so his sign of authority, but also he has chosen to be shown with a helmet an indication of his warrior status. So a portrait will be not only a stylized attempt to demonstrate who is the ruler at the time, uh, but also will be partly propaganda. And just a quick final word about Ethelred is that Ethelred is often known as Ethelred the Unready. Uh, his nickname doesn't actually derive from the modern name Unready, but from the old English word Unread meaning poorly advised. And it's a pun on his name because Ethelred means well advised. So I think it's quite interesting that he's actually shown as a member of the elite at the time. So he is of noble birth, but the fact that he is shown without a helmet, the fact that there's no overt royal regalia, um, is an indication perhaps that he sees himself and his immediate elite community see him as the, the first amongst that community, but not necessarily the warrior leader, uh, which Canute sees himself as. Coins are, coins are fascinating little pieces of both art, history and propaganda. So let's move on to our next object. And our next object is a group of objects. It's known as the Cheapside Hoard. And here we can see some of the objects at the British Museum and a detail close up of a selection of the objects below. Now the objects were discovered in 1912 during the demolition of a timber framed building on Cheapside. And the site is now occupied, as you can see from this modern photograph, by a building known as One New Change and that stands near St Paul's Cathedral. Now the original building being demolished in 1912 had stood on the site since it was rebuilt in 1667 after the fire of London. But the brick lined cellars below were older. And on the 18th of June 1912, workers began to excavate these cellars and while breaking up the floor, they found a wooden box containing jewellery and gems, 400 pieces of Elizabethan and Jacobean jewellery, including rings, brooches, chains, raw gemstones, unworked gemstones, earrings, pendants, scent bottles, fan holders and crystal tankards. And it appears that the hoard represented a goldsmith's stock in trade, buried in Cheapside, which was the commercial centre of London in late Tudor and early Stuart times. Now, the site where it was found was a row of houses owned by the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths. And the row of houses were known as Goldsmiths Row. And the hoard itself reflects London's role in the international gem trade. And for example, within this hoard, a small part of which we can see on screen, there were found to be emeralds from Colombia, sapphires, diamonds and rubies from India and Sri Lanka, topaz from Brazil, lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, Persian turquoise, pearls from Bahrain, and Hungarian opals and garnets. It also contained 
jewellery from Egypt, Byzantine and classical gems, which had themselves been in circulation for at least 1,600 years before the hoard was buried in the mid 1600s. And most of the gold in the hoard is very high purity, 80% purity, which nowadays is 19.2 carats. The hoard itself was probably brought to England from the East Indies in 1631, having been assembled by Gerald Pullman, a Dutch jeweler. He died on the journey and his chest of jewels was taken by Christopher Adams, who was the ship's carpenter. Adams, on arrival in London, was forced to surrender the box to the treasurer of the East India Company. And it was surrendered into the keeping of the first Earl of Lindsay. But the first Earl of Lindsay died at the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642. Now there's one item, a small engraved stone, which bears the arms of William Howard, first Viscount of Stafford. And this helps to date the burial of the hoard between his ennoblement in November 1640 and the Great Fire of London in 1666, which destroyed the building above. When the hoard was discovered, items were sold to a London antique dealer who was known to pay labourers cash for fines from London building sites. The Goldsmith Company didn't assert ownership of the fines and there was no treasure trove inquest. Instead, funds were provided for the London Museum to purchase most of the hoard. However, 25 pieces went to the British Museum, what we see here on screen. A few pieces went to the Guildhall Museum and one golden emerald chain was purchased by the V&A. So currently the hoard sits across several museums in London. The finds were initially exhibited at the London Museum in Kensington in 1914, but it was only a hundred years later, in 2014, that the entire hoard was displayed together for the first time in a hundred years at the Museum of London before going back to the individual museums that own a part of it, including the British Museum. Our next object comes from the Department of Prints and Drawings at the British Museum, and it's actually a drawing. It's a pen drawing in brown ink with a gray watercolor wash. And it dates to around 1640. And it is a view showing the Thames and the Tower of London from the Bermondsey side of the River Thames. And the view includes the north end of the old London Bridge. So if we look up here on the left hand side, you can just see the arches of the old London Bridge running across the Thames. And the two tall church spires, which can be seen, appear to be St Lawrence Poultry, which is just by London Bridge, and St Dunstan's in the East, which sits just above a group of ships on the River Thames. And both these spires were subsequently destroyed in the Great Fire of London. And below, I've put a modern photo so we can match up Tower of London Tower of London, and then the modern buildings stretching along the River Thames, including, of course, the iconic modern gherkin. And the two churches, the spires were both destroyed in the fire of London, and for St Lawrence Poultry, here by London Bridge, uh, the church was never rebuilt. St Dunstan's in the east, which was originally built in 1100 and extended in medieval times, was damaged in the fire of London, but was patched up and a steeple designed by Sir Christopher Wren was added around 1700. 
Then in 1817, it was completely rebuilt in Portland Stone at the cost of £36,000, and Wren's Tower was retained as part of this rebuild. The church was severely damaged in the 1941 Blitz. However, Wren's Tower survived. The church was not rebuilt, and in 1971, the City of London Corporation opened the ruins as a public garden. So part of the church, including the Wren Tower and some of the walls, still stands on the site in which it is shown in this drawing of 1640. Many of the other buildings have completely disappeared and been rebuilt. And of course, if we look here at the far left, we can see that before the embankment of the River Thames, the River Thames was a much wider flowing river, which at the edge was mud banks with wooden timber wharfs built out into the River Thames. Our next object dates to the late 1700s. And we begin with a portrait of the Paris-based Joseph Boulogne, Le Chevalier de St. George, who has had his portrait painted here in London during a visit by Mather Brown. And that painting is the basis for the engraving we can see here on screen, which was made by William Ward. Now, William Ward was an engraver who lived on Warren Place, Hampstead Road, and later the Lengthy Place in Camden Town. The engraving was then published by a printer, Thomas Bradford, in 1788. And at this point, Thomas Bradford was based at 4 Coventry Street. And that was a short street that ran between Piccadilly Circus to Leicester Square. The gentleman shown in this engraving, Joseph, was a French national who was acquainted with Philippe, Duke of Orleans, who at that point was leader of the main opposition to the absolute monarchy of Louis the 16th. And Joseph was sent by the Duke of Orleans to London to meet with the Prince of Wales, who he hoped would support the Duke of Orleans political ambitions in France. Now on one of these visits, Joseph stayed at the Grenier Hotel in Germain Street, and we have here one of the visiting cards that he had printed to show his temporary London address. It's also personalised at the bottom with a small fencing scene. Since Joseph himself was a renowned fencer, and we can see that he's chosen to be shown with his fencing rapier in his portrait, but took part in exhibition matches in London. Now this visiting card, also known as a calling card, is a small card about the size of a bus modern business card used for social purposes. Before the 1700s, visitors in London would have left handwritten notes for friends who were not at home. But by the 1760s, the habit of leaving printed visiting cards decorated on one side with space for a note on the other was developing in France and Italy and quickly spread to Europe and the USA. And as printing technology improved, so elaborate colour designs became more popular. Although by the 1800s, they had gone back to the simpler designs that we can see here on Joseph's card. Now, Joseph himself was involved in the French Revolution and the Revolutionary Army that fought in France against the armies, not only of supporters of the French King, but also supporters of the Queen, who was Austrian, the Austrian armies. And our next object is going to have a little look at a riot, um, a mini revolution in London itself at around the same time. And this tells us all about the Gordon riots, which took place in London in the 1780s. 
And what we have at the top are two scenes showing a military encampment immediately behind the British Museum. And at this point, the British Museum was still housed in the old aristocratic Montague House, which the trustees of the museum had purchased in 1753 to be the home for the museum collection. And the encampment is in the gardens at the back of the museum, which nowadays this area is occupied by the north wing of the modern Victorian building. And in the image to the right, you can see extending eastward behind the old Montague House Gardens, we have houses in Southampton Row and Queen's Square. We can also see the Foundling Hospital and Sadler's well, Wells and a recently built terrace in Grays Inn Road. The area behind the museum at this point being primarily um, pastoral farmland with some little cows that you can see dotted in the far field. Now the London-based Gordon riots were a protest against the Papist Act of 1778 and this bill aimed to reduce official discrimination against British Catholics and in particular it absolved Catholics from taking the religious oath when joining the British Armed Forces. And Lord George Gordon, head of the Protestant Association, argued that the law would enable Catholics to join the British Army and plot treason. And the initial orderly public protest against the act led to widespread rioting, which began on the 2nd of June with the looting and burning of Catholic chapels in foreign embassies in London and lasted until the 9th of June, including attacks on Newgate Prison and the Bank of England. Local magistrates, afraid of angering the protesters, did not issue the Riot Act. And finally, the government sent in the army, resulting in 300 deaths. And to prevent further riots, troops were stationed in St James's Park, the gardens of the British Museum and Hyde Park. And despite their military function, these camps soon became places of fashionable parade and entertainment. And in fact, we can see in this image to the left where some local Londoners have come out for the afternoon to view the encampment of troops. And this map, which is currently held as part of the Royal Collections, shows in detail the British Museum and the encampment of troops in the garden behind it with the pastoral fields, which then ran north from the British Museum up towards modern Camden Town. Our next image is again a print from the Department of Print and Drawings, and it is entitled Over London by Rail. And it's a wood engraving which gives us an insight into Victorian London. And it's a view through a railway arch over the rooftops and back gardens of a tenement block in London with another railway running across the buildings in the background. Now London's first railway had opened in February 1836 and ran between Bermondsey and Deptford later being extended to Greenwich in 1840. It was the first steam railway in London and the first entirely elevated railway with trains running along a four mile viaduct, viaduct. And this indeed could be part of that viaduct that we see here detailed in this drawing. The first London city terminus which was an end station for a line running from other parts of England, opened in August 1841 at Fenchurch. And to allow this to be built, 3,000 people were evicted from the East End to make way for the line. Building a railway at this time meant demolishing existing buildings, and it was easier to get approval for lines that ran through poorer areas where both the buildings and the land 
were cheaper to buy. The Metropolitan Railway was the first railway built underground and it connected several of the London railway terminals. It opened in 1863 and became the first line of the London Underground. We now come into the 20th century and we have a small object known as a love token. It's also an example of World War I trench art in the British Museum collections. A little trench art was actually made in the trenches of World War I, but was rather often made by soldiers and civilians who were often already skilled in metalwork behind the lines. And this particular piece is a love token made from a British George V silver shilling. And it's been smoothed on the back and then engraved with the wording from Fred to Nelly, France 1916. Now, this coin had very little history behind it until it was featured in a British Museum blog. And at that point, the museum was contacted by a lady called Joy, who said that her, gre her great grandfather, her, no, sorry, her grandfather had been a gentleman called Fred. And she believed that the couple mentioned on the coin were her grandparents. Now, we can't know this for certain, but a lot of the facts do seem to slot in with this engraving on the coin. Fred Sharp had been called up in 1916 and had married his sweetheart, Ellen, known as Nellie, on the 5th of August, 1916, at, St. at John Street Baptist Church, the building no longer stands, in Holborn, just before he left for France with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. And the photograph, not held by the British Museum, a family photograph shared by Joy, is taken on their wedding day, showing Fred in his army uniform and Nellie seated. Now, the King's Royal Rifle Corps had 14 battalions at the Battle of the Somme, which ran between July and November 1916. And it's possible that Fred saw action in the battle. He returned home. He and Nellie had three children and eventually lived in Barnet, North London. Nellie died in 1966, and this was the year that the token entered the British Museum as a donation from a lady called Margaret Mary Cavell, who was a member of the British Numismatic Society and lived in Hampstead. So although we cannot know for certain that there is a direct correlation between the people in the wedding photograph and the people inscribed on the back of this love token, there are currently enough links and enough associations specifically with London, not only in terms of the people mentioned, but also then its later history and its donation from a London coin collector to the museum, to suggest that this may indeed be the Fred and Nelly inscribed on the back of this shilling. Now we're going to finish with an object that many of you might be familiar with, objects associated with the community charge, also known as the poll tax, a system of taxation introduced by Margaret Thatcher's government to replace domestic rates in Scotland in 1989 and in England and Wales from 1990. The tax was never implemented in Northern Ireland, which continued to levy rates. And the charge was a flat rate tax on every adult. Now, poll is an old term meaning head or top of the head. And the term poll tax developed because this modern tax resembled a number of historical taxes. For example, Poll taxes had been levied by the governments of John of Gaunt in the 1300s, Charles I and II in the 1600s, and then Mary and William, whose 1698 poll tax was the last one before the modern poll tax. Now, 
as the tax was implemented, implemented, there were protests against it, culminating in a number of poll tax riots, the most serious of which was on the 31st of March 1990, in which up to 200,000 people demonstrated against the tax in Trafalgar Square. And included on this slide, we can see a badge from a number of national and local protests and campaigns against the poll tax, this one issued by the Green Party. After its implementation, there were further protests and campaigns of non-payment. And in 1992, legislation was passed replacing the poll tax with our council tax, which continues today. And what we have here are a couple of leaflets donated by a Camden resident called Marjorie Cagill, which included her community targe instalment payment book, and also one of the leaflets that she was sent by Camden Council, explaining the benefits, i.e. where the poll tax was being spent each financial year in the same way that we often get sent um, a leaflet about the council tax each year showing where different parts of the council tax are being allocated. And I'd like to end by looping all the way back to the ancient world to say that the idea of taxes is not new. And indeed, the idea of poll taxes goes back before medieval Britain to the ancient world. Because what we have here is a piece of pottery inscribed with four lines of Greek which is a receipt for a poll tax paid in the Roman province of Egypt on the 1st of May, AD 105, proving indeed not only are only two things certain, tax and death, but also that there is very little new under the sun when it comes to human activity. Thank you very much indeed for joining me today. That is our final object. And if anyone has any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Catherine. That was fantastic as usual. Let's see what we've got. Um, I think this is about the Cheapside Hall, isn't it? So any idea why the gold hoard was buried and forgotten? It would seem that the collection of objects being made up of finished jewellery and also a number of uncut gems which aren't part of the British Museum collection that this hoard was buried in an act of safekeeping that on its arrival from the East Indies it had become the possession of one of the goldsmiths working on Goldsmith Row and as a way to keep it safe the goldsmith had buried it beneath the floor in the cellar of their house. That means that it would be accessible for them to retrieve individual pieces which they needed for working or for selling, but also that it was kept in a very secure location with them living above it. We know that the building above was destroyed in the Great Fire of London. And one of the definitions of a hoard is that no one returns to retrieve it. This is the part of its history that is missing. We don't know whether the goldsmith themselves uh, was injured or was displaced after the Great Fire of London. We know that very few people were actually killed in the Great Fire of London, but that doesn't preclude the fact that they died elsewhere before they were able to return to a devastated part of the city where civilian access would not have been given immediately, um, hoping to retrieve the hoard, but never being able to do so. Um, so the honest answer is we do not know why it was not retrieved, but the implication is that the person or small group of people who knew where this very precious collection of objects were, were unable to return. And it's usually said that the inability to return is due to death. That's the most common cause because it seems unlikely that they would not come back for it. It was, it was such an incredible collection of objects and was basically their, their life would enable them to continue operating as a jeweler. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just gonna sit, 
at the moment there are if there's any more questions give me a second ah. uh, regarding roman britain's ability to purchase and use high flat pottery pottery what was the what was the draw for world to do romans to come to start off a proverb of a province they did not make money here after, after they arrived so um yeah so regarding roman britain's ability to purchase and use high class pottery what was the draw for well to do romans to come to a far off province pro province of that they did not make money here after they arrived okay right um what i think we see with the development of roman britain is initially you would have had the arrival of the military and the military would have brought with them all the hierarchy of that military. So when we're talking about the elite or the well-off in Roman society, initially in Roman London, we would have been talking about the military elite. And we know from letters up at Vindolanda that the military elite would have brought their family with them. So there would have been a domestic context associated with the military stations across Britain and Wales. Um, in Roman London itself, you would then have had that military elite followed by merchants. So when we see objects of Samian ware, what it is an indication of is someone who is buying expensive dining ware to reflect their wealth and their status, probably through another aspect of their life. So a wealthy military leader, uh, a wealthy merchant, it would also have people been people associated with the administration. So once the province of Britannia became more established, there would have been administrators sent over from continental Europe who would have been running not only the military, but also the finance of the province. And we know that the province was an exporter of British goods such as metal ores. So there would have been administrators who were working on behalf of the Roman Empire, sort of asset stripping Britain and shipping materials back to the heart of the empire on the Italian peninsula. So the Samian ware, whilst we cannot link it to any particular household, what we can do is we can suggest that because it's expensive to buy, you are looking at people who are wealthy in Roman Britain and that wealth would either have come through association with the military, trading wealth, because you were a merchant who had come to Britain to import and export, or um, a high level, I suppose you could call high level so, um, civil servant in the Roman administration. Not everyone in Roman Britain would have access to Samian ware. There would have been a lot of people in Roman Britain who were using what we call coarse ware, um, who would never have been able to buy Samian ware. Also, of course, the other group of people in Roman Britain that we need to think about are the people who were already in Britain. And as we suggested with the Mortaria, there was a level of Celtic Iron Age elite who were also making use of objects such as Samian ware um, to demonstrate not only their wealth, but also to demonstrate their links with the Romans in Gaul, because we know that for about 100 years before Roman Britain and before the establishment of Roman London, certainly in southeast England, there would have been um, rulers of Celtic tribes who were importing and using objects from the Roman world as a sort of a sphere of influence developed and the Romans started to cultivate relationships with some of these rulers so that they sort of had a, a friendly area in southeast, southeast England before they invaded in AD 40, 43, people who were already on their side as they started to build up the province and move north and west. Thank you. Um, in the picture of the Tower of London, it looked very different from today, taller and with pepper pot roofs on the corner towers. What's the explanation for this? What we see with a lot of these old drawings is that one, the artists are not always British artists. So this artist was an artist from Antwerp in Belgium. So they will sometimes bring with them ideas of architecture from other parts of Europe. We also then see the operation of artistic license. And this is always the difficulty with using drawings 
from the past because pre-photography you are looking at the artist's interpretation of that part of London and we know that that particular drawing was collected and then published as a book called Views of London and if you are creating a book what you want to have illustrations that will encourage people to buy your book so I agree with you the Tower of London that you see there it it looks a bit like sort of palaces that we know existed at the time Tudor palaces such as Nunsuch Palace which is knocked down uh, no longer exists which had those slightly ball like tops to them and and had a more sort of medieval renaissance europe feel whereas we know that the tower of london is in essence a, a norman building uh, it's quite block like so i think what we're looking at there is an artist who is embellishing the tower of london with contemporary ideas of architecture that he would have seen on the continent and would have seen being used in Tudor, England, at Nunsuch Palace, um, to make sure that the, the drawings in this book are, are most pleasing to the eye, because at this point he is working as a commercial artist, not as an artist who is recording for posterity. We find them very useful drawings because they tell us about it, London at that time, but in essence, he is using them to make his living. And I, I think it, it's that intersection between reality and artistic license that you often see little elements of in drawings from the past. And I think that's a lovely detail that you picked up there and a perfect example of that process in operation. Thank you. And I think that's also all the questions for today. So um, just to remind you, it's, we're doing mummies next week in the Egyptian afterlife uh, yeah, with Catherine. And I'll uh, thank you for me and I'll let Catherine have the last, last word before we go. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, it was lovely going through those objects from London and I very much look forward to next week where we're going to pivot to a completely different part of the world, to a completely different time. And just to say that you may have a knowledge of mummification. We're not actually going to be looking specifically at the process of mummification. What I'm particularly interested in with our talk next week is we actually look at some objects known as the Book of the Dead, which give us an insight into what Egyptians thought would happen after mummification. And there is an incredibly nuanced and detailed religious vision of the journey that you went on after death uh, with some incredible details captured in these books of the dead um, that give us an insight into the period of afterlife after mummification that isn't often looked at. A lot of talk about mummies and pyramids stops at the sort of the point of burial, the point of active human interaction with the corpse. Uh, what we're going to look at is we're going to go on a cognitive journey and see if we can work out what they believed would happen next. And, and, and it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Have a lovely week, everyone. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone.